We've had a very full day, uh, and we're approaching the end of this very full and very rich day. Uh, and I'm tempted to say that we've saved the best for last, but it's hard when so much of what we've had before, you can't hear over there. I'm under a pillow. Hmm. I don't like being under pillows. Can you hear me now? No. Hmm. Under pillows, underwater. How about now? Are you? Is it better over there now? Okay. Hang on. We'll 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 stand by just one second. Well, thank you for bearing with us. <clears throat> There's so much to go right and so much to go wrong. How about now? If I speak really loudly, is it better? No. Ish? Better? Yeah. I mean, it's clearly wrong. Wait. Hey! Now I need to do a stand-up routine, right? Is that how this works? As I was saying, uh, we've had a great and very full day, uh, and thank you for being with us for this great and very full day. Uh, and I'm tempted to say that we've saved the best for last, but it's a really hard statement to make when so much of the conversation before has been so good. In any case, I think we've saved an excellent session for, for the last. Uh, and what more timely topic uh, than the future of arms control? Uh, I'm going to very briefly introduce uh, my colleague Ankit Panda, who's going to be moderating. Uh, he is the Stanton Senior Fellow at Carnegie in the Nuclear Policy Program. Uh, he's a prolific writer uh, and an even more prolific tweeter on all things nuclear, missile, space, uh, and often North Korea. I'm only slightly envious that he has like 15 times the number of Twitter followers that I have, um, but he'll be moderating the conversation today. Uh, and our speakers are Jill Ruby, who is the DOE Undersecretary uh, for nuclear security and administrator of the National Nuclear Security Administration uh, and agencies whose responsibilities span nonproliferation, nuclear security, and of course arms control, uh, as well as all of the defense programs, namely the nuclear weapons complex. It's uh, a, a massive job, uh, comes with a massive budget, and I think probably a massive set of headaches if I had to guess, um, but it's a job for which Jill is uniquely qualified uh, and suited given her training as an engineer, uh, her broad experiences uh, at Sandia National Labs uh, over 34 years, ultimately rising to be the lab director there uh, in 2015. I have to say that Jill is one of the most level-headed and quietly impressive and effective public servants that I've uh, had the pleasure to work with. Uh, and joining Jill is Ambassador Bonnie Jenkins, who is the Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security. Previously during the Obama administration, uh, she was the Special Envoy and Coordinator of U.S. Threat Reduction Programs uh, she, too, has a mammoth job uh, that is endowed in a set of bureaus known collectively as the T family uh, that are responsible for setting and implementing a range of nuclear policies within the U.S. government. Um, and although Bonnie has spent, I think, most of her career in public service, uh, she's probably been best known in recent years uh, for founding and leading uh, the Women of Color Advancing Peace, Security, and Conflict Transformation, or WCAPS, as it's well known. Um, uh, in that effort, I think she's really been an inspiration for uh, her, her leadership, uh, helping to give voice to communities uh, that have not been well represented in our field uh, and in our policy debates, uh, and to advance uh, the career, security careers of young professionals, uh, especially of women of color. So please join me in welcoming this excellent panel. <laughs> Well, we'll get light, right into it. Um, I guess much like Toby's voice just a few minutes ago, uh, another thing that seems to be underwater these days is arms control. <laughs> and let's hope that, like Toby's voice more recently, that arms control can once again return to the fore to become a tool that not only will serve American national security interests, but help reduce the risk of nuclear war, the cost of competition in peacetime, 
and the consequences of nuclear war should it occur, the three traditional definitions of what arms control might do for us that we first began thinking about during the Cold War. I want to welcome you both to the Carnegie Nuclear Policy Conference. It's really terrific to have you here today. Let me just set the stage a little bit. I know this won't be news to most people in this room, but arms control is underwater these days. We've seen several arms control agreements collapse in recent years, the INF Treaty, the Treaty on Open Skies, a couple notable cases. Bilateral arms control between the US and Russia remains in the form of New START. That's due to expire in 2026. Russia's war against Ukraine, I think, has left many people in Washington rather unenthusiastic about the prospect of sitting across from Vladimir Putin and negotiating an agreement in good faith. But of course, we do continue to have a shared interest in avoiding nuclear Armageddon with the Russian Federation. So we'll talk a little bit about what arms control might look like with Russia. But we look elsewhere around the world and we see troubling trends as well. A Chinese nuclear buildup that's going to take China away from its traditionally lean and effective nuclear deterrent towards something that resembles the forces of the United States and Russia, if not exactly that. Meanwhile, we have a North Korea that's developing tactical nuclear weapons, MIRVs, ICBMs, hypersonic weapons. Is North Korea an arms control problem these days? So we'll get to some of this today uh, uh, in the course of our conversation. Uh, but of course, as we all know, uh, I want to begin with the administration's nuclear posture review. Um, and this is a panel on the future of arms control, so I want to keep our conversation very narrowly focused on what the NPR has to say about the role of arms control as a tool for advancing U.S. national security interests. And to that end, let's open with that. Um, Undersecretary Jenkins, why don't we begin with you? Uh, mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about the discussions the administration had on arms control in the, in the course of drafting the NPR and what the NPR ultimately has to say about arms control as a tool for U.S. national security? Well, first of all, thank you uh, for uh, everyone for inviting me here today uh, for the Carnegie Conference. Um, thank you for laying out all the daunting tasks that we have and uh, uh, on arms control. Um, what I will say is, and we have a panel tomorrow uh, that's going to be on, on NPR, so I don't want to steal the thunder of our colleagues who are going to be talking about the NPR. Um, I'll just say that um, the NPR focuses on you know, safe, secure, effective nuclear deterrent, uh, you know, uh, uh, extended, uh, extended deterrence as well, lowering the role of nuclear weapons, um, but also highlighting the role of arms control and making it clear that arms control and deterrence are two sides of a coin and that we need both in this environment to make things work. And so I just want to highlight the fact that, you know, in our discussions that we've had uh, leading up to the release of, the, of NPR, which I'm so happy is finally out, um, it, arms control was always highly uh, uh, regarded and, and discussed in terms of the importance. And I think just the way, you know, the things you've laid out, uh, where we're in a situation where there's so much uncertainty and so many questions and a lot of things that we're worried about, I think, you know, the need for, you know, transparency, the need for some predictability, which arms control provides, is even more important now, despite the fact that it's a challenging thing to do. We still need, we, I think if anything, we see just how important we need it, uh, just to have some kind of understanding, and we could talk more about that. Mm. Um, but essentially, you know, in my world of arms control, which I've been doing for so long, um, the NPR just highlights the need for it uh, as we look at strengthening our deterrence. Well, thank you. And Administrator Ruby, from your perspective and from the NNSA perspective, uh, what role does arms control have uh, as per the NPR? Um, yeah, well, let me um, thanks, thank you and, and the people at Carnegie for having Bonnie and I do this panel. <coughs> Bar Bonnie and I are real panel buddies, and so hopefully you'll see that today. We're together a lot. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, of course, there's no more important way that Bonnie and I work together than on arms control. I mean, our opportunities are opened by the diplomacy that State Department can do, and our opportunities are our, the need for us is associated with effective monitoring and verification. But let me go back and just like, at the, at the, I'm really happy with the comments on the uh, Nuclear Posture Review on arms control. I think it lays out a strong vision um, that we are not going to let up in arms control just because the time isn't perfect. Um, but it's also clear-eyed about the time isn't perfect. Um, and it talks about what we need to do to um, create an environment, uh, the reasons why we're motivated to do arms control. Uh, and it, um, it also um, you know, specifically mentions that we're not gonna do arms control without you know, um, 
uh, mutual um, verification, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think it sets all, it sets a great stage. It, um, it talks about why it's important. It talks about our commitment to it. Uh, and it, it provides diplomatic and technical folks in the United States a real motivation to continue to work on arms control. Great. Um, and I do want to remind everyone that we do, of course, still have the app for the Q&A session, so get your questions in. And on the NPR, I know we have two great public servants here from the administration. Insofar as you ask questions about the NPR, I would encourage you to keep them related to arms control. There will be an opportunity to talk about other questions related to the NPR tomorrow at the 4 o'clock session. So let's move on a bit. Um, something that's come up a lot lately, uh, and, and the administration's also been talking about this, is the notion of a new arms control framework. Uh, with Russia. This, th this word framework has appeared in several documents, including President Biden's letter uh, released on August 4th at the, at the start of the NPT review conference in which the president expressed an interest in pursuing meaningful reciprocal arms limits between the United States and, and the Russian Federation. What do we mean when we say framework? Uh, and what might a future framework look like if not a traditional treaty that imposes reciprocal limits on strategic offensive arms? What are other ways to advance arms control? Um, well, a couple, a couple of responses. First of all, um, when we were having discussions with Russia at the end of last year, we approached it as a dialogue. Okay, so we didn't say arms control start, to start out. We said these are strategic stability dialogue. And in that dialogue, we included a lot of issues. So not just the traditional issues that you would want uh, extended in a, in a new START treaty, but we wanted to bring in other uh, types of weapons, uh, hypersonics, new types of weapons, quote unquote tactical nuclear weapons, all nuclear weapons, but we also brought in cybersecurity. We also brought in AI. We also brought in space. Um, uh, military, uh, military that has a strategic effect. I mean, so we were willing to have a negotiation that was going to be much more broad. What actually ended up in a traditional treaty was not yet decided. It was, let's start the conversation by looking at the strategic environment and what we need to pull into a discussion as we look at where we are today. And then that would eventually lead to, let's sit down and have negotiations for what's gonna follow on from New Start. So that kind of sets the stage, understanding that it was not, from the beginning, gonna be just, let's just talk about just what's in past hard security uh, 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 traditional treaties. The other thing to think about is when we, def when we talk about arms control, we need to think about it broadly, as you're saying. So there's some traditional arms control treaties that we've had in the past, but the per what is the purpose of arms control? What is the purpose of having these discussions? It's more broad. It's about transparency. It's about building confidence. It's about confidence building measures. It's about, and there's different forms of doing that, whether it's notifications, um, whether it's you know risk reduction, what we want to do is try to change the, per the perception of arms control as just being one thing and understanding that we need to bring in other ways in which we, we try to uh, increase predictability in this time where there's so much uncertainty. Um, and so my, when I look at the question, it's not what's the future of arms control, it's also about why we need arms control. Let's get back to what's the purpose of it and why we need it and not question whether, it, whether it's going to exist, but how do we make sure it happens because we are in a situation where we need to have some kind of ongoing discussions and exchanges of information, whatever that's gonna to be, to increase predictability, particularly if you're talking about the PRC, where there is not that kind of exchange happening yet despite our efforts to try to create that. Mm -hmm. We will come back to China in a second, I assure you. But, but I wanted to ask you about something the administration announced earlier this year. The vice president announced a unilateral moratorium on the testing of direct ascent anti-satellite weapons in a destructive manner against satellites. And the United States has now brought uh, specific allies uh, and is attempting to get other countries on board. Uh, now, that's a very interesting kind of innovative approach to reducing risks. And of course, it's not in the nuclear domain. We're talking about the space domain. But in the, in the six months or so since that effort was announced and uh, has since been built on, uh, have you taken away any lessons that might be applicable to the nuclear domain, for instance? Um, we're still building the um, international consensus on that. What we're doing, for example, in the first committee right now, we have a resolution which we're getting co-sponsors uh, on. And we have discussions at the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva. Uh, there's an open-ended working group on space. 
And one of the things we're trying to focus on is um, developing norms. You know, as we look at different types of web uh, issues today, whether it's emerging technology to AI, you know, and as, as I talked about the way in which we're trying to build transparency, we also recognize that there's a role for norms. And, you know, there's a question about whether space could be a traditional arms control treaty. So we're looking at how do we develop norms with countries agreed to to say there's certain things we're just not going to do. And so in, in the arms control space, it goes back to what I said before, it's looking at the different ways in which we can approach the arms control arena broadly defined. And of course, we, you know, when we get back to the talking with Russia, you know, um, we don't know where we'll start off from. We don't know where, you know, where, whether where we left off in December is going to be where we start again because things have changed a lot. Um, but we are going to approach it in a broad way. To, but, but ultimately, we recognize that 2026 is when the New START Treaty ends. So we need to make sure that we have something in place for that. Can you imagine us sitting down with the Russian Federation to talk about arms control while a, while a single Russian boot remains on Ukrainian territory? What I will say is there's two things that the president has said. One is we will get to back together and talking with Russia when Russia acts in good faith. And the president also said that, you know, in, we know these, there's a lot of di difficult issues, but we are committed. We want to go back into a, a discussion on arms control. So we don't know what that situation is going to, when that time comes, what it will look like. But we, may, we remain committed to, to negotiations, to have something following New START. Um, we, just haven't, we just haven't figured out what that's going to be or when that's going to come. Administrator Ruby, turning over to you, uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit about NNSA's activities right now in support of arms control today and in the future. Um, recently, we've heard about the Arms Control Advancement Initiative, uh, which is a new initiative to support arms control more generally. Can you tell us a little bit more about this? What does the initiative seek to accomplish? Uh, well, thanks. Yeah, let me start maybe by um, just paint, I think all of, all of you know, but just like, let's just remember the big picture here and arms control, and I'm going to include proliferation in that because they're so related. So it's not a good time. Um, there has been a lot happening. Um, the environment for arms control because of international events is not good, but the risk of proliferation is also not going down and is arguably, you know, getting difficult with the expansion of nuclear power, with um, new, um, new actors, with, um, I mean, IAEA, who we count on to help us with the proliferation problem, is absolutely swamped. Um, with traditional issues and non-traditional issues. And so we've got, to, you know, I also worry about that. Um, the war in Ukraine has um, caused us to think a little bit differently about um, our, you know, national security strategies. We know we've got tactical, for example, tactical nuclear weapons are kind of in the news, at least, you know, where I live. Um, and, um, and dual-use weapons are increasingly important in, um, in strategies that both Russia and China seem to be deploying. So I do that because this is the motivation for an arms control advancement initiative, right, is to just sort of lay, let's look at the landscape. So in my opinion, we can't just keep doing what we've been doing in terms of monitoring and verification, but, which, by the way, is both reasonably simple and hasn't changed a lot through the course of our bilateral treaties with Russia. And so the, um, so the Arms Control Advancement Initiative is aimed to build from what we have, make sure we maintain that and improve it, and build beyond it in several ways. So one is uh, invest more in research and development for new technologies that can address the new problems. Um, and with that, we want to build some test beds so that when the very smart people in the United States and around the world work on this problem, we can do um, an apples to apples comparison of results in the same test bed. So yeah, about half of what we're proposing in the Arms Control Advancement Initiative is research. 
Then in addition to that, um, we are uh, building uh, a user facility. I mean, it's kind of a funny name for it because the number of users will be rather, rather limited because it's at Pantex. But the idea is that it's in a honest to goodness assembly, disassembly area for US nuclear weapons. And so for those ideas that advance beyond the research phase and look potentially practical, to deploy that we can practice con ops and we can practice on real or surrogate materials and shapes that are very close to something that we would expect to see. Uh, and um, we're also, as part of this initiative, want to make sure we continue and even uh, advance our activities with international partners. Um, uh, with the Quad, well, the UK is always a special partner, the Quad, um, IP, NVD, and um, and other international players because we recognize nuclear you know, needs all, everybody's head in this game and a lot of people care about it and we wanna capitalize on that. And then finally, and pretty excitingly, um, the fourth element is we've learned from um, our stockpile stewardship program and the nuclear weapons side that when not much is going on, you actually have to really pay attention to keeping people knowledgeable and aware and um, training programs uh, and sustainment programs for, and so we're doing that in arms control for the first time is we're, um, we have a, a, a program, an element of this advanced, is this arms control advancement initiative aimed at human capital, uh, teaching them about what's been done, looking to, uh, you know, um, being knowledgeable in policy space and technology space about arms control. So those are the four important elements. I'm really excited about it. You know, there, I mean, uh, Corey and I actually led a study for the National Academies before we had the jobs that we have now um, about monitoring and verification. And so we had a very clear idea of what we needed to do. Um, and of course, the staff in NNSA has helped, you know, uh, flesh that out a lot. That's fantastic. I want to stay on monitoring and verification for just a second longer. So it strikes me that if we're talking about frameworks that might not be treaties in the future, one of the issues we'll run into is inspectors won't have legal protections. That's one of the, the benefits of treaties. And so when we think about verification and monitoring, we obviously still care about making sure that we can ascertain with a high degree of, of confidence that compliance is, is being demonstrated by whoever we might engage in arms control. So is technology gonna solve some of those problems for us if we can't have treaties and we might not be able to have people on the ground? What technologies are you most excited about in the verification space right now? Yeah, well, <clears throat> this is a great question. Uh, and, and so uh, one of, well, there's, a, there's several ideas. I mean, the, the big idea is what can you do remotely, right? So, I mean, we, all, we, we are all of a mindset, including me, that one of the advantages of arms control is you've got boots on the ground. And therefore you have a much better idea of what's going on because you know, you've got people on both sides, well maybe, maybe in the future, all sides looking at each other's real systems in some way. But if you don't have any coverage, uh, you know, uh, then what, you know, what can you do remotely either through new types of robotics, where, you know, you know, I mean, I think this is quite interesting. We say, here's our robot, here's what it does. You do all your regular checks, same, vice versa. Maybe we, and we control it, you know, from the U.S. in, uh, you know, foreign territory um, to do some of this stuff. It, it, look, I know it's got lots of problems, but that's a technology idea uh, that, you know, has, I think, some potential. Um, obviously, um, imaging from the sky has gotten a lot better. It has a lot more uh, spatial resolution, it has more temporal resolution. Um, we can see, you know, chemical species. So I think, I think there may be, now, um, technology never solves every problem. Um, I mean, I'm a, I love technology as much as anybody, but, you know, recognizing it doesn't solve all problems. You have to, we're gonna have to have a will to want to do this, we're going to have to have a will to allow that it might not be perfect exactly when we start. We may have to relax what we're willing to let other people see. Um, it's, you know, it's going to be, it's not going to be easy. Uh, but I do think technology has, well, I can say, you know, 
without a doubt, the technology has advanced a lot since the equipment that we're using for New START was developed. This was developed for START, and it was actually developed before that. And so we're talking about technologies that are really they're adequate. They do what we want. The treaty was designed around them, you know, to work. But we would like to make sure that any treaty that we design for the future, um, there's technology that can verify that in some way, and it's going to have to be different. Great, thank you. So I want to come back to China, as I promised. Um, so it's clear that we're seeing a significant shift in the contours of China's traditionally lean and effective nuclear forces. Uh, most prominently, uh, Beijing is building three new large fields for fixed land-based ICBMs, and DOD has publicly assessed that the Chinese leadership likely intends to pursue a stockpile of 1,000 warheads by the end of the decade. That's a big change in the arms control environment, as, insofar as U.S. interests are concerned. So there have been some attempts to raise this. Um, prominently, I think this was raised at the uh, November 21 virtual summit between President Biden and President Xi. But Under Secretary Jenkins, I wanted to ask you, does the administration have a broader theory of engagement with China on strategic nuclear matters right now? Beyond telling China that this is something we care about and we want to talk about in an arms control setting, what is the broader theory that the administration has for actually advancing arms control with China, if not now, then in the future? Well, first of all, we have to get them to the table. I mean, whatever theory we have, it's not going to work unless we can actually have a conversation with them. Um, we do have conversations with China. Uh, I don't want to give you the impression that we don't have any. Uh, we, we talk with them in many different aspects and many different forums, whether it's, you know, the MPT Review Conference, First Committee, you know, we have these conversations with them. But to have the type of conversations that we want, where we will just, I'm not even saying arms control, just risk reduction, as I said, as a version of arms control, just get to the table and talk to us. Um, that has not been successful to date. So, um, you know, that is, that is fundamental. Um, we have, of course, had conversations with them in the P5, but of course the P5 is not really functioning right now. Um, so, you know, we are continuing to engage them, to try to get them to the table to talk more serious about, um, about ways in which we can talk, issues we can talk about that they just, we want to hear from them. We also talk with our allies. Um, many of them have relationships with, with China, so they are also um, using their di diplomatic uh, uh, avenues to encourage them to engage with the U.S. Um, and so, you know, it's not just us trying to give the message to them, it's others, because other countries also understand the importance of us having a conversation with, with China, and they, they're not having conversations with them either. So they have the exact same concerns that we have, um, that there's not the kind of openness to try to understand and what's going on to reduce the chances of miscalculation, and, and just to have some kind of transparency, to have that dialogue that we can build upon uh, later. So it's a continued, I mean, the strategy is continued having the conversation between uh, President Biden and, 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 uh, and Xi, you know, conversations we have with them on different forums, continuing to push the need, working with our allies and others and partners to so you know, leverage them. But to date, it really hasn't been successful, unfortunately. So staying in Asia for a moment, we've got another problem, right? We have a country that President Nixon once called a fourth-rate pipsqueak that's now on the verge of deploying tactical nuclear weapons and potentially MIRVs, if we believe Kim Jong-un, of course, talking about North Korea. Now, the NPR acknowledges that North Korea does present a nuclear threat to the United States, um, but arms control is not mentioned in the context of North Korea. At what point does that change? At what point do we treat North Korea, which is an increasingly capable nuclear adversary of the United States, as an arms control problem? And does arms control and risk reduction have any role to play in managing our relationship with Pyongyang? If, once again, if they would have a conversation with us. I mean, I think um, arms control can always be an option if you have two willing countries willing to sit down at the table and talk. And not just arms control, but risk reduction, everything that leads up to a traditional arms control treaty and all the different aspects of arms control um, that we can have with them. Uh, we've made it very clear to the DPRK, as you probably know, that we're ready to talk to them. We have no preconditions to a conversation with them. Um, we'll talk to them anytime, any place they're willing to do it. Again, they have not come back with any interest in having a conversation with, them, with us. Um, you know, so the, the possibilities exist if we can create the, the situation with them to have these discussions. So it's not, it's not as if 
things are off the table because we push them off the table. They're off the table because the, the, the environment that we need to have those conversations aren't there yet. So if Kim picked up the phone, he could expect to have a conversation with the United States about arms control? If he, if he picked up the phone and said, I want to talk about arms control, we're not going to say no. I think if anything, we would want to explore what that means. We would want to get, we would say, okay, you want to talk about arms control? Let's have a conversation to see what that, what that means. You know, we often, and I think, I think what we saw uh, when President Trump was doing his outreach, there was a difference of opinion of what arms control is. I mean, there was not, from my understanding, there wasn't a lot of meeting of the minds on what the conversation was going to be, what we meant by nuclear disarmament, what they meant by uh, nuclear disarmament. A lot of the groundwork wasn't laid to really understand what we're trying to do together. Um, so I think we'd have to start with a conversation of what is it that we're trying to achieve, um, get that groundwork, and that takes time, but we would certainly not say no if they say we want to talk arms control. We'd want to say, okay, let's, let's talk about this and see what that means. Great. Um, so I do want to go to our audience questions, which are pouring in here, and I don't think we'll have time to get to all of them, uh, but I'd like to cover as many as we can. Uh, the first question comes from Andre Buklitsky uh, for you, Undersecretary Jenkins. Uh, so Andre notes that there are people in the United States uh, who would argue that the U.S. needs to build up its nuclear arsenal to simultaneously compete with two peer competitors by the end of this decade. And new start limits are what is holding Washington back currently from doing this. It won't as of 2026. How would you respond to them? I would say that building more weapons is not the answer. Um, I would say that having, I, we've had an arms race and now we are in a position where we, we spent billions and billions of dollars to build weapons. We spent billions and billions of dollars to get rid of them. Um, I don't think that going back into that scenario is going to answer any questions. I think we should certainly be aware, be cognizant, be prepared to deal with situations, um, strengthening our deterrence, strengthen our extended deterrence, do everything we can, um, but automatically assuming that building more, I'm not sure that's the automatic. I think that's an understandable um, belief and certainly, you know, it, if, if you're looking at the situation, I can see why somebody would say that. But we've lived through that and um, that's not necessarily what we want to do based on what we've done before. So I understand this, I understand the sentiment. It's a difficult time. We're all feeling a little nervous about Russia, nuclear stable rattling. We're watching what China's doing in terms of building us nuclear weapons. We haven't had a chance to sit down and talk with Russia about another treaty and, you know, so I totally get that. But before we do something like that, spending money that I'm not sure we have that we spent on it before, uh, we need to be much more um, thoughtful. Thank you. Uh, Administrator Ruby, we have a question for you from Molly Hurley who asks, how are the bottom lines of the NNSA or labs like Sandia affected by either moderate arms control or complete nuclear disarmament, and what could this mean for the prospects of these efforts? Well, for, uh, let me, I, I've got to weigh in on this previous question. Please do. <laughs> um, so it is the case that, I mean, you can, you can create a logic for more weapons, but you, you really have to stand back from that. Right, I mean, so we've got 1550, Russia's got 1550, maybe China's aiming for 1550, we, you know, some number like that. That's a lot of nuclear weapons. Uh, and it's hard to believe that war is gonna be any different with 2,000 each or 3,000 each. Um, it's, it's gonna end in the same place and that's not gonna be a place that many of us wanna be. So. I would just say that I think this administration and all the discussions we had about the NPR, um, not to steal the thunder, but um, I, I think it's pretty clear that we're not after just building up a nuclear arsenal that's larger. Um, and I think it's important that we say that. Um, so just on that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think this question is aimed at um, am I afraid that arms control will under, uh, undercut some way the um, whole value of the national security enterprise? Uh, the, the second the, the question you really asked me. Um, and uh, not at all. Um, because the national security enterprise exists 
um, to make sure deterrence is done right. Uh, and look, if, if uh, I'm convinced, I'm a product of, you know, I'm admittedly a product of that environment, but that the science and technology uh, that's done by this enterprise is gonna be important. It won't be the same, it'll be important. Uh, we can't not do large science and technology, and the beauty of this model that we have of federally funded research and development centers and laboratories that really do large team science, really fundamentally understand things, will exist in some different format, working on some different problems, if we get to that point, um, and I, you know, uh, it's, we've talked about it for a long time, and it's just, it's not something that I worry about, nor do I think anybody else should worry about it. Um, we, you know, the labs exist, the enterprise exists to do the right thing. And if that's the right thing, that's what we'll do. Great. Um, moving ahead, we have a question here that brings us to arms control and, and new technologies and new domains. Uh, so Tim Thies asks, on behavioral norms as an alternative to treaty-based arms control, what measures do you envisage to reduce risks from the cybersphere that threaten nuclear capabilities? And I might also just take the chair's prerogative here to add uh, new technologies like artificial intelligence. Do codes of conduct and mechanisms of that sort have a role to play? This question is really for either of you. I guess I'll, I'll start by saying um, we're actually thinking very much about codes of conduct and, and uh, rule, rules of the road, codes of conduct, norms. It's, it's kind of what I was talking about before in terms of space. We, there's two things. One, there's a lot we still need to learn about the role of emerging technologies and nuclear. I mean, I think there's still a lot yet to be understood. We certainly don't, we certainly have concerns about AI and nuclear command and control, so we have some definite concerns. But there's also a lot to learn in terms of its role in national security, um, how we can advance some things like verification uh, when we talk about um, arms control. So there's still a lot to be learned, in this, and we're still doing that. Um, but we certainly also see a strong role for norms and rules of the road and you know, however you want to call it in terms of uh, AI and, um, and all emerging technologies right now. So it, it's an important, it's something that we're promoting, um, not just in terms of space, but that's a, that's a point we're really promoting with countries is what is the role of norms and how do we get countries to agree to norms um, in terms of a lot of these emerging tech? Mm -hmm. um, I wanna move a little bit to a question here that gets at the push and pull between the executive branch and the legislative branch of the United States. So the president's nuclear posture review, uh, among other things, canceled the nuclear sea launched cruise missile. But yet Congress funded the program uh, this year. And so moving forward on, on these new systems, uh, like the sea launch cruise missile, uh, will that jeopardize US leadership on arms control, this sort of tug of war that we sometimes see uh, between Capitol Hill and the White House? And can we critique Russia's investment in and threats to use non-strategic nuclear weapons as we develop our own? Well, maybe I can start on this one. The, uh, I would just say that this idea of what systems should re be retained and what systems we could cancel and how it impacted arms control was well thought out in the discussions we had on the nuclear posture review. So that was recognized. Like, if we build this system, is it gonna help us in arms control negotiations? Is it gonna hurt us in arms control negotiations? And we had those discussions. Those are not like, you know, those were real discussions had by real people in this administration mm -hmm. to make decisions about these systems. Um, and if anybody actually knows the 23 budget, I'd, I'd love to know it, you know, right? So, um, we, so I, I don't think we know what Congress is gonna fund relative to these systems yet, right? Um, so. And I, I would just add, I disagree. There were a lot of discussions on this and, you know, whether the disagreement between the administration and executive branch will hurt our leadership, I will say, our partners and allies know our system almost better than we do. Um, and so they know that you know, the difference between the administration and Congress is nothing new. Um, and you know, we've been able to maintain leadership through many years despite the differences that we've had uh, between the two branches. So um, for them, it's, you know, that's the US system, that's what they do. Um, it's complicated sometimes, but I don't think that they would 
look at that as a testament to what to our leadership on these issues. Mm -hmm. Also, just uh, staying on this for a moment, uh, Emily Spiller asks, uh, on the domestic front, do you think the ratification process in the Senate represents a significant challenge to securing any future arms control agreements? I might add to that, are we thinking more about frameworks and non-treaty arrangements because of the Senate or genuinely because that's the best way forward in the current international security environment? Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, to, say, to say it's not a challenge for arms control would definitely not be true. Um, we recognized it with, you know, um, with, we know that what comes after New START, you know, it's in the back of our minds, it has to be ratified, we know that. Um, you know, JCPOA, you know, they were, I mean, during the confirmation, they were always like hammering us about that. Um, CTBT is still not ratified. So um, yes, it is a, it's certainly um, a challenge and we think about that when we're in negotiations, we think about the fact that we have to bring this back home, you know? Um, so that definitely does, does play a role, but it, at, the, at the same time, it's not a debilitating factor. We gotta do what we gotta do and we'll deal with that when we, when we take it back to, to the Senate, but we also have a relationship with with the Hill, we, we brief them on things. We let them know they're always asking for briefings on what's going on with JCPOA, what's going on with this. I mean, my, a lot of my folks here from the, from, from the T family are on the Hill all the time talking to staffers. So we do have a communication with them. So we anticipate problems, but we also try to be engaged. Yeah, I just wanna put in a plug for this framework idea going back to the technology question a few questions back. The, um, the framework idea, it, it, it may well end up with a, a way to do some things that are sh shy of treaties uh, and the ratification, but the beauty of it is you can introduce new technologies in time and you maybe can change those agreements faster than you could change agreements about, say, strategic nuclear weapons, which have been, until recently, you know, a, a pretty stable thing, right, what they, what they were. So you didn't, you didn't need to go back and make changes. But if you have a framework that has cyber or has autonomy or AI or, you know, that, and that technology is changing more quickly, this framework idea allows um, a um, more temporal ability to evaluate, I think. Um, and just to add to that, um, you know, part of your question was, you know, does that, does a challenge with the Hill have an impact on what we decide to do? Um, I would say that, like, for example, we're talking about the norms for emerging tech or space. Um, a lot of that is not so much because we're worried about the Senate, it's just because that's the way we think the best way to actually move forward in those particular domains. Gotcha. Um, Administrator Ruby, uh, I wanna come back uh, a bit to the Arms Control Advancement Initiative, because uh, we have a question here from Nick Roth, who wants to know a little bit more specifically about the activities that will take place at Pantex relating to that initiative, if you can share more on that. Yeah, well, um, what we're hoping to do is um, to, dedicate, to dedicate a space, a cell, for those of you who know Pantex, and since I know Nick kind of does, um, to this initiative, right? So that we have a place that is its um, primary purpose or sole purpose is to allow people to come in and do testing uh, so that they don't have to wait in line, so they don't have to get at the end of the line, um, and that can move this thing along faster. Now, this initiative has not started. It's a 23 request, right? I mean, we've done some work to get it ready. Um, and there was some, but so that had, that is not happening yet, but I see this the, the Nuclear Posture Review is quite supportive of revitalizing, recapitalizing the nuclear security enterprise, and you know I see this as part of that. So we haven't talked about trilateral arms control, which was an idea that the last administration was particularly enthusiastic about. Uh, so Kylie Jones, uh, our junior fellow here at Carnegie, actually asks, China has mentioned on several occasions that they refuse to enter trilateral arms control negotiations with the US and Russia, and the Russians have their own reservations. So is there a future for trilateral arms control, and can China be integrated into a, the arms control fold with the US and Russia while a quantitative gap remains between the three countries? A uh, couple responses on that. Um, 
as you said, the trilateral was attempted. Uh, there were a lot of challenges, obviously, on that. Uh, we don't see that as the way to go right now. Uh, we can't even get China into our bilat. I don't think that they are very interested in having the type of conversations we want to have with them in a trilateral either, and they made it very clear to us. Um, so, um, you know, in the in the P5 context where we were meeting, um, we we were we talked risk reduction, but they didn't want. I mean, even in that situation, they didn't want. They wouldn't have you know that kind of those kind of discussions. So. Um, that's, that, that's not possible. Um, on the second one question, you know, when we were meeting with the Russians, you know, last year, you know, we mentioned several times that, you know, we're doing this in the context of knowing that there's something else out there, you know, and we're having, you know, we're gonna continue to have our conversations on, you know, a strategic stability, but we can't, you know, and, and the China's not in the room with us but we are aware that China's out there and, and building up their nuclear arsenal while we're talking about reducing ours. And so while it's not, it's not gonna be a factor, or, and, you know, and Russia was just kind of like, well, you know, whatever. Um, and it's not a factor in terms of our desire to get back with the, in, in the strategic stability dialogue, um, it, it's out there and we know it's out there. And so that's something, that's, that's the other elephant in the room that's kind of sitting out there that we have to figure out how we're gonna deal with. I wanna pull on this for just another second. Uh, one of the issues that I know is of interest to a lot of people in this room is track two diplomacy. Uh, and, and traditionally during the Cold War, we, we saw track two efforts uh, have some success, uh, particularly the scientific communities in the United States and the Soviet Union demonstrated the value of new arms control ideas to their respective national leaderships. But when I look at China today and particularly after the 20th Party Congress, which you know I think is an indictment of the, you know, the demise of collective leadership, the personification of leadership in Xi Jinping, the, the changing intellectual climate in China, we see less and less evidence that track two efforts are feeding into the views that the Chinese leadership might have on arms control and disarmament issues in particular. If you had to give this audience some advice on track two efforts right now on, on Russia and China in particular, what would be most helpful for the administration? Uh, and, and do you see track two having a role to play in the current environment? Um, well, track two has always been, I thought, um, uh, something that we should continue to do because I think there is a value in track two diplomacy. Um, however, I think the important thing is to make sh is, is who's at the table and who's 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 involved. You know, even in our efforts, um, we've had a difficult time convincing the PRC to bring the right military people to the table. Um, it's you have to figure out who's making the decisions. Um, there's influence and there's impact um, and direct impact. And the question you're asking is, you know, the dialogue is good in the sense that, you know, I, I appreciate when colleagues in the NGO community have track two and come back and talk, and we share information about, you know, what might, what, might, what might help, what we should be thinking about that we might not have thought about. It's very valuable. But having the right people in the room, and China has been very, uh, reluctant to bring the right people to the conversation who will have direct impact on the decision making. So I understand your question totally um, uh, on that point. And so I think that's, and it's not easy. It's not easy when they don't want to bring them or when they know that bringing them means that they're in a position where they have to be serious about the conversation. Mm -hmm. so. so changing gears totally for a second, we do have a question here on the JCPOA. Um, Jack Kennedy asks, do you, think the, do you think there remains a realistic prospect of reviving the agreement? Uh, and do you think the administration could have done more to make negotiations successful? I think there'll always be a question about whether we could do more. I think when there's something doesn't seem like it's gonna be successful, there's always that question. Because there's always, there's always choices that you make in a process. And there's always, uh, could I, do, I can go this way or I can go this way, or I can go th these two ways or this way. And so every time you make a choice, and it goes a different direction, that means you didn't take another option. So I think there's always gonna be um, uh, a question of um, what could else you could have done, you could have done this, um, but you make the choices that you make at the time based on the information that you have and based on the engagements that you have with people who you trust their opinions. Um, so that's, that's, that kind of goes with the territory. 
Um, but yes, it's very challenging right now. I mean, we still see it, the U.S. still sees the JCPOA as the best way to prevent um, uh, Iranian uh, nuclear weapons uh, acquisition. But we also are at a time where it's very challenging. And we also have our concerns with Iran giving UAVs to Russia and violating uh, UN Security Council resolutions. So that just makes it even more challenging right now. So it's not at a good point. Um, but I will say, you know, second guessing has its limits because um, you just, you can always second guess. You can always, you know, circumstances that were back then are different now. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's healthy to, to um, look back and say what we could have done better, um, assuming things don't work out. But I wouldn't um, focus too much on that and, and just say, choices were made at the time the best that people thought that they were. So we have a few minutes left, uh, and we have a question here on, on a normative matter, uh, which, which um, Beatrice Finn asks, uh, which is absent new arms control and disarmament agreements, what is the United States doing to stigmatize and delegitimize nuclear threats right now? Uh, and do you believe the TPNW can be helpful to strengthening the norms against threats to use nuclear weapons? Um, well, I know Beatrice Finn knows, my <laughs> knows our position on that. I mean, I think, you know, um, you know, there's a number of things that we were trying to do in terms of, um, you know, highlighting the, the role of arms control, the need to control weapons, um, the importance of deterrence and the role that arms control plays in deterrence. Um, and, you know, a number of documents that we have produced during the NPT Review Conference, the, the P5 statement that was released earlier, uh, which is also very interesting because that was something that Russia really pushed for us to, to put out. Um, so, you know, we're, 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 we're working and doing what we are able to do under the circumstances in terms of trying to um, reduce the role of nuclear weapons, which is uh, a major point of the NPR, um, and reduce the focus on it and try to find ways to work with all countries to um, disarm and move forward under non-proliferation review, I mean, non-proliferation obligations and other, other treaty obligations. So um, as far as the TPNW, um, you know, I think people know our concerns about the treaty and um, whether we see it as a viable way to really get toward disarmament. Yeah. So before we close out, I want to ask you both a closing question uh, that sometimes comes up in discussions about the future of arms control. Uh, I remember in my last trip to Russia in 2019, specifically having this conversation with a few Russians interested in arms control. And of course, we're having this conference on the 60th anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And the question is that, does it take a crisis to get the world interested in arms control again? Does it take a crisis to get the Chinese leadership to see the value of arms control? Uh, I see some issues with that. You know, you roll the dice on enough crises, sometimes the dice doesn't roll in your favor. Uh, mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to replay the Cuban Missile Crisis even if I knew it would lead to arms control. And so I'm really curious for both of your views on that idea mm -hmm. and the role that crises play in sparking arms control. <clears throat> well, I mean, ordinarily I would like to answer this question. Of course not, but right now I might, my temptation is to say I hope so uh, because we kind of have a crisis. Um, and I hope we can use it to reinvigorate um, our, the global interest in arms control. And I think there are plenty of, you know, I think there are opportunities to do that. They're not immediate, they're right, not right in front of our face, but that's what we have to be, you know, avail, uh, ready to do is, this, this could turn quick, right? Um, and, you know, we have to be ready to take advantage of this, you know, pretty scary moment in time and things nuclear to, um, to advance strategic stability and risk reduction and arms control and proliferation and the whole set of things that we care about. Um, uh, but, you know, I mean, it's, it is a bad situation right now as you laid out in the very beginning that, you know, we've got new start. Um, you know, well, we should remember a few others, but, you know, new start. Uh, but we do have new start. You know, and that was really close to not having a new start, right? So we still do have what is a, a very important treaty at this moment in time. Uh, 
And we have managed to do it. So, um, you know, we should take advantage of the crisis. We shouldn't ignore the crisis. It's, you know, we, I mean, I really hope something good comes out of this. But, uh, but in general, uh, hopefully not. And hopefully, you know, people can, you know, recognize the, um, the stability that has been provided by arms control. And we've got a lot of good international norms and good international allies and good international partners to help us with this um, that are stronger as a result of what's going on. So I, 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 I need to and I want to stay optimistic about this. Great. Under Secretary Jenkins, we'll give you the last word on this. Um, I've been doing arms control for a long time. And um, this is certainly one of the more um, concerning times that I've, I've seen. Um, but it has resulted in much more interest in arms control. I'm seeing a lot more people caring about the issue, wondering what's going to happen, nervous. Um, so it creates a desire to, to know more, to learn more. Um, I wish it didn't take a crisis for um, more people to be concerned, but I recognize the fact that this is just an issue that a lot of people say, let, let them deal with it. We know that we feel good, things are going on, they're working on it, so we're going to focus on other things. Um, uh, but, this is a, but this is a moment to really have these kind of discussions, um, you know, keep the interest in these issues because, um, you know, it hasn't disappeared. People may not be focused on it, but it's still here. And it's been here for a long time. And we've been working on it for a long time. Um, and we will continue to work on these issues. And, I, and like Jill, I hope that, you know, we'll, something positive will actually um, result, or at least nothing negative <laughs> will result. Um, but there is a lot to learn about, and, and it's a time for, for interest in this. Um, even though, unfortunately, it's a crisis situation that's creating it. Um, and and to, to also highlight what Jill was saying, we do have new start. We still have notifications that the Russians give us. Um, you know, they're still notifying when they do things under start. Um, we still have them as in notifying that they're in compliance with the treaty. It's the kind of thing that we saw, we say, good faith. That's the kind of thing that they could be doing is continuing to abide by the new start treaty. We're looking at dates now to meet with the Russians to discuss, you know, resuming inspections. And so we're committed to, um, to continuing to implement New START. Um, and there's still an interest uh, by the Russians to do that. Um, and we're just hoping that, you know, this, this will uh, eventually lead and to some point to getting back to the table with them uh, to discuss what happens after START. But yes, it is a crisis that gets this moving, unfortunately. Well, lots to think about there. Uh, before I invite everybody to give um, our two speakers a warm round of applause, I do want to let everybody know that we will be having our closing reception for day one of the conference in Regency BCD, just outside. And I'm sure there'll be a lot to talk about, given the food for thought that we've gotten from both our great speakers today. And uh, with that, join me in giving them a round of applause. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Really perfect. Thank you.